I've just the dogs just jumped up on the seat and just started staring at this opposite. <laughs> Hello everyone. Obviously, I'm Danny Hart, and you found your way to my YouTube channel. And today I'm doing something a little bit different. This afternoon I was sat in my living room wondering what to do with my day. Obviously, we haven't got a lot going on at the moment and it's nice outside, but we can't really do a great deal. So I was sat trawling through YouTube a little bit bored and I ended up giving my mechanic a ring, Scotty, and saying, look, I want to interview you. I want to let everybody hear your story from where you started and just what's, what's gone on through, through your career and to where you've got now. So I rang him and that must have been about two o'clock this afternoon and what are we now? It's quarter to five. So it hasn't really been long long planned or anything like that. It's just I was bored and I wanted to see how how this would turn out. So it's a first test and we'll see what happens and can maybe do it again in the future with with different people. So yeah, we'll move on and so we've got Scotty here, my mechanic from just my mechanic from 2019, so he just started with me. And yeah, how's it going, Scott? What have you been up to today? Not a lot to do. I had a few hours in the shop this morning, catching up on some jobs and stuff. I dropped a bike off for somebody at Hexham, just a friend of, of, of mine and Danny's who we ride motocross with now and again. And a good friend of Danny's, good friend Alan Brayton as well. He's, he's one of his good friends. So, <laughs> but no, yeah, so I'd firstly, say let's, let's start. With where where we're meant to start, I guess. So, where are you from, and how old are you, Scott? I am thirty-one now. I live in Gateshead, I guess Gateshead, and I started racing when I was fifteen. Yeah. Obviously, we first me and Danny go back a long way. I first met Danny when I was like fourteen years old. It's quite a good story to to how we first met. Actually, isn't it, yeah, Danny? So I met you. It must have been around two thousand four, two thousand and five. We were just doing runs at Hampstead. Well, I was doing runs at Hampstead. I'm not sure whether you were on the uplift or not, but I think you'd, you'd just put clips on your bike and um, came over the, the infamous tabletop at the bike park and took a tumble over the handlebars and broke both your wrists. So if you want to talk about that a little bit, I'm sure everyone would want to hear about that, your, our first encounter. <laughs> Definitely, it was good. I always remember we I can't remember whether there was uplifts on or not, but I remember we were pushed up and I always remember the same bit of track we went in on. We started just above the, the drop, just above the tabletop. And since that day, I would never, ever start from the track in that same point. <laughs> it feel like it was a bit of a thing, but that was that, that happened. And then I, I always remember I'd done it, landed on both my arms, broke both my wrists and ran down the cabin. And I always remember your dad was, nah, you're all right, you'll be okay. You haven't broke your wrists and stuff. And... That was when the cabin was in the middle, wasn't it? It wasn't at the top back then. I think we used to uplift in a, was it a yellow transit or something as well? Yellow transit. I think Craig used to go straight up the middle road. I, I don't know how that thing got up there. But. Yeah, so you come down to the cabin. My dad was there telling you, oh, stop being soft. You haven't done anything here. Yeah. And then Steve, who I was with there, like old Steve Foster, he used to take us to riding a lot. He took us to hospital and... Obviously, first X-rays were like, "Yep, you broke both arm, both bones, and both wrists." So it's good to ring Paul and say, "I, you were all right." <laughs> but, uh, and then, it's funny that, that was then at Hamsterley, there wasn't even—I remember there wasn't even a bridge at the bottom of the track, and there was just yeah. a fallen down tree. And we weren't really very big in stature, so we had to help one another get across that, across that fallen tree. And yeah, it was a real nightmare. I think you were riding a Mr. Big back then. Do you want to let everybody know about, about them bikes? It was. Uh, that was uh, a friend of mine when I first started sort of riding. He, the base of Newcastle, the son, Steve Barker, he raced World Cups. I think he had a couple of good like top 30 results at World Cups. I used to do all my summer holidays and stuff. I used to work in their car, ma car maintenance garage, mm -hmm. sort of earning some money in their garage to pay for a bike for myself. And my mum and dad, they put a few quid towards it as well. And that was my first bike, home-built home -built bike. Yeah, and I seem to remember me struggling to lift that bike for you when we were trying to get over that, over that tree bridge at the bottom because then things weren't light, were they? I think I was riding a Scott back then as well. So 
yeah. kind of like like for for me. Yeah. Well, that thing yours wasn't wasn't the yeah. lightest. Yours got a single crown Sherman's on it, did it? That's right. Yeah, I actually rode for MB UK Scott, who and the team manager back then was my team manager now, Will Longdon. So it's yeah. funny how sort of gone full circle from ultimate amateur to now. It was 50, 52 pounds that bike was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so from then on, you obviously you started racing. I'm sure you cut, you must cut the. Was it? I'm sure you, you started with doing your local races up at Chopwell and at Hamsterley, and you had a good crew, crew of lads up there around Newcastle that used to take you here, there, and everywhere. Yeah, I think we'd done, I think it was like a, a call like a wet and wild winter series or something, what we'd done in Hamsley. And no, that then, was in a Leithen, wasn't it? Leithen, right. That was in a Leithen yeah. when Pro Bike Sport used to run it. That's right. The first, like, known race was in NPS back then yeah. in Leithen, and I was in the open category when they used to run that. And then my second race was actually Fort William. And so, you didn't? start as a juvenile did you i think did you go straight into youth or some or maybe you did but you weren't really as competitive as you would have been in the coming years when you first yeah. started but then, moving yeah. forward a little bit from there i seem to remember you racing the world champs in fort william in 2007 and that would be was that your first international race or not no i had done my very first race with shawbury Right, yeah, talk about that. That was when, that was... I oh, just go on, go on. That. Was that when, when it was a proper track? It was a proper track. <laughs> <laughs> like, I always remember even Petey coming down and being like, I haven't done a run yet and stayed on my bike. And like, yeah. back then, Steve was still very competitive and it was like, wow. And that's all everybody wanted to do on that track is just get down there was no speed nothing you knew you were having a good run and yeah. qualifying went my way and stuff and in finals I just come down before the rain started and got 27th and it was good I got all my points for the next year and tell fun. me about um Dave Wardell in the start line I always remember there was it was I think the way we qualified I think Dave was in front of us I was behind Dave and then Pete was behind me. And then and anybody who knows Dave Wardell or Bullhead, as, aka Bullhead, know that he's quite a, a funny, happy, charming guy, you know, always laughing and joking and having a good time. But what was he like that day, Scott? It wasn't. I, was, I remember I was like, my first World Cup, Dave's in front of us. I'd watched him in videos. Steve's behind us. I was just super excited to be there. And Dave was like, Shut up, this is serious. And I was like, sorry. And I think even Steve was laughing behind us, but I guess I get the reason why Dave would have been because honestly it was it was pretty hard track to just get down. Yeah, so he was all all Very ready and trying to get in the right headspace to tackle the the steep yeah. hill steep steep mountain of Champery. Yeah. So that was the start of you on the international scene. Yeah, so talk about Fort William, the World Championships, and obviously you were you made the team as a junior, and we sent a really full team with it being a home race, and, and you made the team obviously with your good result at Champry, and domestically you were doing really well as well, putting it up there with the top guys in junior, and then yeah, so you made the World Champs team for Fort William, and that must I'm not even going to say that was a dream come true because you probably hadn't even dreamed of doing that at this point. Definitely not. It was it was amazing. It was always as well. I mean, even from then on, I've always been like a private key, I feel like, and that's probably one of the only races I've done where it was as if I was a full factory rider. Like we had the setup there, all the companies were there. We had all were, were proteins, everything it was all everything was cooked for. We, we stayed in like a lovely all the log cabins at Fort William. I was staying with Josh and I think Marcus Williams at the time, yeah. um, and it was yeah. really cool. That's really cool because I think then like the budgets from British Cycling and, and everything was a bit more big time than what it is now. Like now the budgeting for the world champs for the downhill isn't really. No, it's a definitely. sore subject to be honest. And um, I remember I was a year too young to race the world champs that year. I raced yeah. the next year in Val de Sol, but 
I was there watching and yeah, it was really hard to watch because I, I really would have loved to have raced the home world champs, especially for the first one. Like yeah, so and then moving forward from that you you really served your time racing the World Cups, travelling around, doing what you could. So yeah, tell us about how you managed racing the World Cups. I I've got some notes here and obviously you travelled during the World Cups, you were driving a lot of the time and and you were travelling with with Will and with with Mark Beaumont, Bullhead potentially, DC, Dan Critchlow from Bergte. Lots of cool guys. So there must be some cool stories from them days. Ah, it was Yeah, what's it, that what was that like? It wasn't quite like it is now. Nobody was behaving back then. I think every night I come home from from a day on the track and boom on or on Neil Donaghy would empty my kit bag upside down and <laughs> filled it with bits of fruit and bits of salad and everything. And it was good. It was a big learning curve. I, I got a few choice nicknames across the years and some of them nicknames still start now, but it was yeah, I think good. it's Greg Minard. Every time I'm with you and and we come across Greg Minard, whether it be on a track walk or walk just walking around doing whatever, Greg always refers to you as, as the nickname that he must remember you by. And are you gonna let our our viewers know what that is? It's a bit X rated, but it's not too bad. I used to it was a uh, knobhead and I, <laughs> it was and funny. Where did that come from then? I don't know what I, I guess I think when I first Went to the first race, I think Beaumont was just while walking around, the, I think we walked the track and stuff. And I think Greg was one of the first people we bumped into. And Mark was like, oh, this is not bad. Just That's rolled it. off. And it stuck. That, stuck now, still 12 years later, 13 years later, that's still there. <laughs> I <laughs> seem good. to remember you telling me a story about Mark luring you out onto the balcony and stealing your towel and you stood out there <laughs> naked what was that one that was slovenia 2008 he emptied me kid bag but he took all my boxer shorts out <laughs> did them well. and i was like where's my boxers i come out of the shower i was all hot out of the shower i was angry and he was like ah nah they're on the balcony as i stepped out he kicked us in the back dragged the towel off us and i must have had about two inches of towel and we're on a ground floor as well there was a busload of people just pulled outside. I was slamming on the door, let us in, let us in. And him and Neil Donaghy were crying in the room. It was, it was hilarious. It I was think good. Mark it. must have been returning jokes that have been done on him over the years. He spent a lot of time with Pete and, and people like that. And I'm sure he was the, the root of a lot of their jokes. So Definitely, definitely. Yeah, so yeah, well, moving could, on uh, from that, yeah. you then... You were at, what bike were you riding for the for that part of your your um, world Seven out campaign? Two thousand seven, Giant Glory. You had that for a little while, weren't you? I think two thousand no, just just two thousand seven. I think. Right. I think I was still on a Mister Big in 06. Yeah. Then I went on Giant. So, what was your favourite World Cup track? <sighs> I think me the best feeling track. Is Fort William. I don't know whether the crowds help that, mm -hmm. the speed, the, the obstacles, or what. Yeah. Probably the track I, I do. I think I would probably Schladming. Schladming is just so fun. We, obviously, we don't race there anymore, but yeah. that was just a good track. I don't know. I'm, I'm sticking with Fort William, I think. I think that's, I, I really like it there. Yeah, Fort William's good. I think the whole weekend of the World Cup with the crowd and. Yeah, the atmosphere always just makes up for it. So then I seem to remember you riding a zombie. Yeah. Do you care to that was talk a about that a little bit? I know you I mean, don't. You you didn't get stiffed by anyone on that, but I'm sure yeah. a few people did. It was a bit of a funny one. It was a, it was a guy who sort of, I think he, he started a team got some good sponsors and stuff and I think he got way in over his head, didn't realise what he was getting involved with. He did know a lot of people in the industry, he had a lot of contacts and I sort of, I was a joiner at the time. I'd been a joiner for Gates of Council and I, I put in, I quit work for six months to go racing for this team. This was like my first factory team. Um, the bikes were pretty good. They were a Polish brand. The company, they were really good to deal with. Did you go out to Poland and, and ride over there? 
I was supposed to go and do a Polish national, but I had tonsillitis. Oh, that's what <laughs> I remember. Tonsillitis. So, and I was gutted because, like, I was only, I wasn't miles off Neil Donoghue back then. He was yeah. racing for the team and he won by absolutely miles. And I remember he got a lot of pride. I know Neil didn't get paid, did he? No, there was a lot of. It wasn't a very good time for him and I think it was Helen Gaskell, wasn't it? Ah, uh, yeah, Helen Gaskell. So it was a shame with them. But in the end, I probably come out on top because yeah, yeah, you did well. one of the sponsors who he had got into the team carried and on with you. Touch with them and they had carried on helping me. Yeah, um, for sure. Yeah, so then a few years down the line, you're racing World Cups and traveling around the world, driving, flying over to Canada. And I don't, by your standards, I think, I don't think it was going how you really wanted it to. You know, you were, you were traveling around the world just trying to qualify. And I can't, Im- I can't remember how many times I would come to the bottom and just try to see you qualify for that final and you would just miss out. And then yeah. I think it, there came a point where you were like, right, I, I think that's it now. I, I need to go and try and, and figure my life out away from riding. I don't, I don't think I'm going to make it to what I, I always set out to. Yeah. And I think part of that was like you were with me all the time and you saw that I was on the factory teams and I was doing this and doing that and traveling around and you really wanted to try and get to that standard. And, and yeah, I don't think it quite worked for you. So then you, you went down the avenue of, of opening a bike shop, which Cycle Fix, which in the northeast now is one of the premier premier names in the in the bike shop industry. So talk to us about that a little bit and where did that start and, and where you've got to now. Yeah, you're right about that. Like you see, I, I had to I come to a point where I didn't feel like I was gonna go any faster. I was quite fast at that point. I think I had six to the last ever national I'd done, yeah. which I was really happy with in the lead and I just thought Obviously, then I hurt myself with me and you, but we'll talk about that later. And it was just a bit of a turning point where I was like, right, let's get my head down. I'm still race, I'm still have fun and take the pressure away. So I was a joint at the time, I quit work and I went away doing a bit join me by myself. Yeah. Then I bumped into a, a guy called Jonathan, he's got a big MOT centre up here. Yeah. And started Cycle Fix, and from then on, it was just brilliant. We started a tiny little unit, what he owned. Yeah. And then moved into the front of his MOT centre. I think at the time you were still, you were doing a bit in the MOT garage and you were flitting between the bike shop as well because the bike shop at the time was only just kicking off and it obviously didn't have enough enough custom, if you like, to be in there full time. So it, you were still working hard in the MOT garage and going across to the bike shop as well. Yeah, he really that really worked well because I didn't have to put pressure on myself in the cycle shop to make money. Yeah. Uh, with with Jonathan and, and the team there at Auto Fix and that was really well. I got a little bit of a wage from them. I helped him out. He helped me out. And now I kind of return the favour as well. Now his his son Charlie does a few days sure, here and there in the shop and Charlie's a really good rider. With his bikes and everything, don't you? He can, he can ride a motocross bike well and he can ride a downhill bike really well and I try and help him as much as I can. He's a real good kid, and yeah. the other son, Jack, as well. They've had a they've had a tough innings a few times, and it's a real good family. So that was the start of your venture into like the retail world of cycling. Then you moved on to another shop in Concord. I, I remember over near Sunderland. Yeah. And then you've moved on again, and you've set yourself set yourself up on Berkeley High Street and it seems to me like you've got a really good business going and it's booming. So talk to us about how it's going now and what you do. Obviously you do that. That's your your main thing in between mechanicing with me and yeah, so talk about that a little bit. I it's good like we're just sort of right next to the Angel of the North in Gieta. So location's good just off the A one. The rent's quite cheap in the area where art it all works well and I think it just works because through me racing, people respect that I raced. I kind of know what I'm talking about because I've had results. I've fixed my own bikes for so many years. Now I'm working with you. That helps work on a factory team, obviously. Yeah. You've been in the North as well, well recognised all over the world. And it just I think the key with that has just been you've just got to be very honest with people, very honest with customers. Don't tell them what they want to hear. 
tell them what you know. Yeah, you yeah, want to try making stuff up to make yourself sound special like anybody else. Be honest with them. And it's just over the years, it's just where we've been open seven years now and it, it couldn't be better really at the time. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, it's going really well and every bike around um, your shop will have been through your shop at one time or another. So, yeah. yeah, you've got a really good customer base there and it's a really good group of, a really good group around there that are always riding. So I'm going to take it back a little bit now and back to when we were a bit younger and you were probably in serving your apprenticeship as a joiner at the council and paving your way in the in the bodybuilding world so yeah i remember going to atlantis gym with you walking in there all these big meat heads and, and all these big guys plates bouncing from wall to wall really couldn't eat, eat you, dinner. Uh, you took part in their gym show yeah oh, that was a fun time that was oh, funny i don't Good think i need to say any more no, I don't. I was, I think, I done two shows. I think yeah, one. Yeah, I remember. I I only remember the first one mainly because seventeen when I done the first one, then nineteen when I done the second one. But it was just more bit of a fun. It was like kind of say you joined in with a group and they do an event, you get involved. That was kind of it. It was the gym bodybuilding show, and it was the under eighteens or the under twenty ones class at the time. And the first year I, I done it, I won. Yeah, it you took the victory. Six or seven. Oh. Million. <laughs> and you've carried it ever since to be fair i mean it must be i mean i'm, I'm not gonna be cheeky and say it must be genetics because you've got to work hard as well and yeah. and i know like you love the gym you work out all the time and yeah it's a lot of dedication and that's really shows like you shows. even said you ain't having you like sometimes i'm maybe just fear that training over actually riding the bike sometimes not that i preferred yeah. it but i saw training as an easy way of doing things and pick that rather than going on a bike ride sometimes and that might have been a bit of a doubt yeah yeah another Never thing you went pardon the pun like two feet first into was mma you spent yeah. a lot of time on the mat rolling around fighting and um yeah that's definitely that was kind of like for the faint-hearted I was sort of trying to find another thing to put the effort enjoy. into. I uh, things what I would enjoy, but would also incorporate training for my mountain bikes. And obviously, yeah. fighting is not brilliant because of the injuries it does hold with, but hand eye coordination, speed, cardio, it all kind of worked well. And I really enjoyed doing I it. I remember coming to the stadium of light actually to, to watch one of your fights, and you, it was an, you weren't the no show, but your opponent never showed up. He must have. Uh, been so, looking on Facebook or something and <laughs> saw what he was coming up against. I remember that. I dropped my opponent changed three times in the week leading up to the fight. And he still never showed up. Nah, all three opponents, nothing. And loads happened. of us came, I remember. It was so many, but that happens so much and it's it's hard for the small clubs to do it, but Do you it still is. get into the gym and have a I said they say roll around, don't they? But yeah. Still have a tussle. I've got a gym like Joey, a lad, John Bell, he owns the fight pit just next to where I live now, and it's a yeah. real good little gym, good setup. Got a nice cage there, and a hell of a group of lads. And more, just when I get time to, I love to go there, and it's, it's brilliant. I think one thing that did make that more difficult for you was your injury that you sustained in, what was it, 20, 2017 or 2018? 2016, it was. The 16, last. yeah, because I just won the World Cups and you weren't there to celebrate. Yeah, so we were riding at Coast Gravity Park. It's not in Whistler. It was when we were in Whistler, we got the ferry across to the Sunshine Coast and we were doing some runs over in Coast Gravity Park. And there were some jumps that were shut off, but they opened them up because we were thinking about riding them. In fact, when we pulled in, we all said, no, we're not going to bother with them. We're not doing it. We're not riding them. And then... Scott was riding in the in the normal trails and doing his whips and his one footers and all this and everyone was, Well, oh, Scott this, Scott that. I was like, bugger this. I'm gonna go do these jumps, watch this. So I went, eyed them up, did them scary jumps. We were on full race downhill bikes, bearing in mind. 
if you come off the seat. Jumps were not for hard, they, you could jump them on a hard tail, but they were for more of a short travel, stiff. They're actually Brendan Howie's jumps for one of his edits that he did. Yeah, so I did them a little sketchy. And Scott's rolling in, checking them out, rolling in, checking them out. And he did the first one. No, I've done the first, first run through. I've done them, didn't I? Like, perfect. That's and I it. Think first run through, he does them. We go back up. Right? I do them. I'm at the bottom, waiting, waiting. Because you come, you jump over one of the roads and I'm waiting. And he doesn't come. So then I, I push up around the corner. And I see everybody, everybody around Scott. I'm thinking, oh God, what's he doing? So far. And then my girlfriend, then now wife, tells me Scott's had a big crash and he's broken his leg and his elbow's sticking out of his arm. And I'm like, oh no, you've got to be joking. <laughs> and I'm not very good with this stuff. So I didn't go and see, which, yeah, it's probably not good of best friend not to go and see his pal laid on the floor, but everybody's fussing, and I don't want to go and stress the situation out even more. And, yeah, Scott had come off, and I think he bailed off the bike and landed straight on his, on his leg, on his, on his backside, and snapped his femur in half. So, yeah, that was a really, really bad few days for you, Scott, wasn't it? I remember, like, I think I woke up from the operation like two days later. I had like a seven hour operation, just snapped my femur in three places and compound elbow fracture. And I woke up, and I always remember when, like, you guys come and seen us, and I was sort Never of drifting, bothered. drifting in and out of consciousness. And I remember the mindset then. I was like, I think you were just selling the, everything, the shop was Andy, going, you were done. Andy, whoever, list everything, I'm selling everything, I'm done. Yeah. And then, 12 hours later, your mind was just flipping. I can remember the pain I was in then. It was horrific, like really bad. I think you just kind of start forgetting it. And then the next day I was like, ah, I'll be okay. And then I done, I got back from that trip and got straight back to training as soon as I could. Obviously, had a nice first-class flight home from yeah, British Airways. Yeah. Didn't invite Danny into the, into the lounge. <laughs> I was in the peasants group. You know, our friend Vinny and the bugger fell asleep for the full eight hour flight. But in Vinny's in Vinny's defence, him and Helen, his wife, really helped you out in getting oh. you home and looking after you. And and I didn't really, we couldn't do anything. We were like, it was Vinny and and Helen. They were they were really onto it. So I didn't blame yeah. you for having Vinny. Helen and, and has a lot to do with insurance company and stuff, so she yeah. kind of. Basically, my mum was just a mess, obviously, the way I was. Well, you can imagine anyone's uh, mother, their, their baby's on the other side of the world, his legs in two bits and his elbows sticking out of his arm and he, he gets compartment syndrome and mm. they want to chop your leg off and your mum's at home, helpless, really. Yeah. Be, like now I've just become a, a dad. I can't imagine it. And, uh, she wanted to fly over and I was like, I'm a bit strange when I've hurt myself or... Even yeah, if I've got the flu or I'm sick, I just like to be on my own and nobody around us. And she was like, I'm flying over. I was like, do not fly over. I'll be yeah. fool to fly over. And it, it, it was all the way it was. I remember when I walked home, I, I like, Binny, we got a private taxi home from Heathrow and Binny helped us in the, in the house. And I remember my just looking at his burst into tears because I'd lost like two and a half stone in seven yeah, days. like a different person. The eyes were sticking we've got out. a picture. We'll have to insert the picture and... Sure, well, everybody. What? It wasn't. It wasn't. Mister Atlantis looked like that day. <laughs> so. So yeah, I think really for you that was sort of the beginning of the end of you racing. Totally at that point, wasn't it? I mean, you've done a couple of races mm-hmm. over I the had... last few years. You, you well, last year, what you won? Did you win expert at A yeah. Forest and were like fifth overall, and then. Well, after that, like before that was probably the best season I'd had until I hurt myself. I qualified at every race I'd done. I had a couple of top 40s at World Cups. Just and taking I, it more relaxed though, weren't you? You weren't uh, going to all the races and you weren't uh, putting loads of pressure on yourself. And then more of a good time. 2017, I went and raced Fort William World Cup and Leo Gang World Cup. 
And yeah. after yoga, I just had a feeling like I feel as fast as I was, but I don't want this as much as I used to anymore. This was after your leg. This is the time to do it. So I think I've done three races after I'd hurt myself, like at the level I used to race at and knew it was enough. So I had a full year off then, pretty much. So what and did I, you do in that time? What like I know when we're racing and we're all in and we're everything from tunnels tunnel vision to the first race and yeah. to, to to racing, that's it, training and racing. So what what did you do in that time potentially that you hadn't done in the previous off seasons and in the previous downtime where you ride motocross week in, week out in the off season where you maybe didn't do that so much? What what took your time up? T- to be fair, I didn't really change my day to day life much. I was still working. obviously the shop was thriving then, and I trained the same as I used to train because I never wanted to let that drop because I knew as soon as I start backing off from that, yeah. you might never get trained as much. So I've always kept that up, mm-hmm. and it was I can't even remember. I just had no inspiration to ride my bike I think whatsoever. You became a bit more of a social butterfly in, in I, town. In the new well, castle. Yeah, going out a little bit more, you concentrated on your relationships a little bit more. You figured right. that out. Yeah. You Tinder There's took a back good. seat and you, you found Maxine. Is that in this time or not? Yeah. No, uh, not too much longer after that, but it was uh, it was good. Like you, when you're racing and stuff, you know yourself. It's all yeah. about you. Ah, it has to be all about you. Okay. Not, not in a selfish way, but like every single thing you do, the time you go to bed, you train the way you eat. Everything relates to when you're racing on Sunday. Yeah, it and does, yeah. normal life has to take a sidestep. But I don't regret any of them years. I raced the World Series for 10 years. and it No, was for sure not. It's an amazing thing to do, isn't it? I mean, kids can only dream of being in them positions. I know you worked hard for it and you didn't have the, the backing that some of us have, but you had a good time and you enjoyed it. So, yeah. yeah. So then move, we'll move forward a few years and I think it's... New Year's Eve in 2018 into 2019 and I'm sat at your house on the sofa and I get an email or, or a phone call to say, oh Danny, we've been dropped in at you. We, we haven't got a mechanic for you for next season. I'm sat next to you and I say, Scott, do you fancy it? And uh, I think yeah, what, what I think. Do you How, what did you have to think about it? What was your thought process through that? I think the first thing I said to you when you said that was, well, I'll do it for 60 grand for you. <laughs> and then you went, oh, seriously, though, Scott, like, let's talk. And I think, like, two days later, I signed the contract with Will. And I was over the moon, like, it was really good. It was something I've always thought I could do that. And obviously, the first person I would ever want to work with was you, and it would, it would always work well. And I think, as well, you've got the respect for me. You knew I raced, you knew his stuff. We know, we'd never really bat heads because... I know how to speak to you, you know how to speak to me, and I'm also not scared to also say, like, oh, Danny, you're not right there. And that, that, that works well, being honest and being friends, and it's never, I think it's almost been like when we're at a race, nine or five, we are working together. Yeah, After the hours, we're best friends, and that is the key, I think. I think one so, of the reasons I thought you would be, be good for this, the role of my mechanic was, you sort of knew what it took to, you'd. You'd never had your own mechanic as such, but you, you'd seen what it takes and you'd been around mechanics on the scene. And for me, it gave you a second chance to be successful on the world scene, but taking it down a different avenue, if you like. And I don't know if that's true or not, but I do feel like that has been the case. You know, you didn't quite make, like we said earlier, you didn't quite do what you potentially wanted to do but with yeah. my help and mechanicing for me you've been able to um sort of do it in a different in a different context it was that was obviously one thing me you spoke and Sophia as well we all spoke about it and like you know what you've got to do yeah Scott and you know after all the jokes and the carry on you know I get the job done when I need yeah. to and it was like on my I, notes that I've got down here I, I've got that you're known as a joker, but when you have to do work, you know that it's work time and the job gets done. And I'm sure yeah. everybody on the team, from the team manager, Will Longdon to 
to all the other mechanics and all the other riders and my wife Sophia, everyone can vouch that you are a grafter and yeah, you you work hundred percent and you know exactly no job's too small, it's the same. Everyone on the Madison Saracen team is the same and and you fit in really well with that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like, I think it's, it's, like it's been brilliant. We have I've kind of went from where a lot of mechanics would work up. I've kind of luckily jumped that spot to yeah. be to the top of the sport. Yeah, for sure, yeah. It was amazing the support we get, all the parts we get, unlimited, it's great. And I, I really appreciate that. And I, I think, think what it, could be strange for you is, like, I want you to talk about how before you were, like, we always had this competitive thing between us, even though, like we were totally different. Whether we would, like if we we're racing at Hamsterley or something, or you'd always want to beat me, or if we were timing, it was always one to beat me. But now it's a totally other end of the scale where you're doing everything in your power for me to be the best and beat everybody. Yeah. So yeah, it's quite. It is good. Like I, I like said, like the like Will and Rob and stuff who we worked with last year. I've never ever been so nervous in my life. Even when I was racing world champs, didn't make any difference. I think the main thing is I know sort of half of what I'm doing to you, your bike and stuff, can really affect your result. So yeah. that's the like things I want to make sure that's been. I never really I thought I would have maybe come into this role and maybe it's been a bit like, damn, I wish I was in Danny's position, but I've never that's won. That's another single... question I've got above there is do you miss racing? I do and I do want like I really, really enjoy doing what we're doing now. And I think it doesn't feel like, I wish I was doing that. Yeah, I'm not jealous, so you're not bitter about not anything. Like when I see you do well and stuff, and it's always like emotional and I see you total different. I always knew you, I thought I knew you. And then now I'm in this position, I only knew half of you. The way yeah. you treat everything, the way you're so monotonous about all the things you do the way you do the GoPro stuff, the laptop, everything. It's so down with tea and it's so good to see you do that. It's, it's a real open of a It really makes me feel like, sort of makes the hairs on my arms stand up talking about it. And I just think of that last race when we were in Snowshoe and I'm in the start line and I turn around and I just get like a nod of approval from you. It's like, it's yeah. quite surreal, like what we go through in them situations. So, it's like a yeah. tool, like, the emotional side of it's like no one ever sees that, but it's so much because you're doing every single thing for three minutes, and it's yeah. it's it's crazy. Yeah, so I guess we're sort of getting to the end of it now. Is there anything you'd like to talk about? Um, no, I mean it's obviously everything's took a big turn in the last two years with starting to work for you, and it's really good. Like I say, I've, I'd never once turned around and thought any like, damn. Yeah. I'm doing this now. I should still be racing. That hasn't even. I still feel like I've achieved to almost the top level. Yeah. The position I'm in now with you and the team, and 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 it's weird because I kind of started out with Will as well. Like you started out with Will, like our current team manager. He took me to World Cups for the first two years. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you were traveling. Yeah. It's all it all sort of worked hand in hand. Now I'm taking Will to World Cups in a way. Maybe I would have been this year because I'd be driving. <laughs> oh, I would like to hear what he says about that. If he let us, if he let us drive the truck. <laughs> I was not that way. Really. He would never let us drive the van or really. He was like, no, I'm driving. Be yeah, I, th to I think it's going to be similar now, you know. I don't think that's going to change too much. <laughs> it should be fun. Should yeah, be so fun. the team put you through your, I don't know what, exact, what class. Who I think it is that can drive up to. 48 whatever ton. it is so scott can now drive the team lorry and he's going to yeah. be doing that a little bit more this season well he was before uh -huh. all this stuff that's kicked off yeah so yeah moving on to the final thing i've got some quick fire questions Aye. right so you're on death row what's your final meal gammon it's gotta be gammon Gammon fried egg, chips. You love, a, you love a slab of gammon, don't you? What colour is your toothbrush? Blue. Blue, nice. Blue. What colour is Maxine's pink? I think it's just what you share? Yesterday. I think hers is red. 
Look. If you could be any animal, what would it be and why? I hate these questions, but I'm asking them so it's totally good question, fine. Good good question, basic good questions. Um, well, I have always dreamt of flying, so it would probably have to be like an, a bald eagle or something. Okay, so, like, it's quite good yeah, choice. I can fly. I'd love to fly. That's a brilliant choice. Right. If a movie was made of your life, what genre would it be and who would play you? <laughs> Coming with a. Um, Jason Statham. Oh, yeah, hardcore. <laughs> The genre would probably be action comedy, maybe. Right. There you go. With a bit of drama. If you could go anywhere in the world, where would you go and why? Um, it's halfway on the questions. Ooh, I, that's a hard one. I'm trying to think of somewhere, because really I'd only relate that to somewhere I've been. To be fair, I went to Mexico last year with my girlfriend Maxine, and that place is out of this world. The people treat you so nice. It would probably be there on the beach. You're a millionaire Just... compared to that. I mean, <laughs> right, so Mexico it is. Cool. Right, what's the next one? What's one thing that annoys you the most? Loud noises when in normal things like in the house. Slamming plates around when they're getting dried. I have to shout at me girlfriend all the time for that. <laughs> well, I know the answer to this one, but let's see if there's anything else. What is the strangest thing you've eaten? My <laughs> <laughs> birthday meal for the team, what the team organised for us, it was something called gizads, which is actually the processing part of the chicken which crunches the corn, and it was diabolical. <laughs> Absolutely diabolical, but I manned up and ate the full meal. And you and Rob Jarman just... Me and Rob. Rob turned up and went, I've got to eat it now, haven't I? <laughs> and he sat there, nearly thrown up. That thrown was up. where were we? Were we in Ponte de Lima in Portugal <laughs> and trying to find any sort of like... I don't even know if the right term is like Western, but... It's not the right term, but any ah, sort of... Eating the meals while the horse is getting treated. This was like a... What was it? It was a horse, like... Yeah, horse, I think. Wasn't it? Really strange. Yeah. yeah and Scotty had the chicken gizzards. He was the only one. I don't think he'll ever choose them again. Right, what's next? What is the one thing you've always wanted to do? Fly but that's not really possible. So possibly wingsuit. Wing, oh. That's a close set to do. Squirrel suit, wingsuit. S <laughs> squirrel suit. That's what it's based on. It's based <laughs> on a squirrel. It is. It's based on a fly. Right. So you want to fly. Go to fly. Right. Okay, moving on. If you were stranded on a tropical island, what two things would you want with you? This is another one that some gets asked quite frequently in these sorts of things. And I can never answer them, but you with the imagination that you've got and the sense of humour, I'm thinking you have this on lockdown. Nah, it's hard. Like, maybe it's some Budweiser's. Yeah. <laughs> and the full gym with the swimming pool. A full gym. To a fitness centre. That's true. Oh, is that... In the same thing, the gym and the I'm a bit <laughs> you don't ask for much, then, do you? Nah. Right, the last question, which I thought would be a good one for you what word would you add to the dictionary if you could, and what would it mean? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Jesus, I don't know. Come on, you think of something like you do out of the blue, all these random words that you often come out with when you're on one. Electrolyte. <laughs> and what does that mean then? So well, you've got a drink, what's an electrolyte? Yeah. So it's a something what you get electrolytes from. So it's got like, this, this gives me 
No, it's like taste. Sorry, it's like it makes you think that. So this is very electrolyte. <laughs> no, this is like, like ish. A, when people put ish on the end, you put ie. You sound a bit more friendly. <laughs> well, there you go then, electrolyte. And but we don't right. really have a meaning, but just run with it. Good. I think that's about it, really. So if anybody wants to find you on social media or get in touch with you how would they go about doing it it's uh, scotty dog scotty dirk sorry d-e-r-g -E on instagram and facebook and then my shop is cycle fix limited on instagram mm -hmm. and facebook so go on there have a bit chatting if you need any help with anything, any of your fox suspension setups or anything like that just just give a shout brilliant so yeah that's it that's the first little interview that I've done I feel like it's gone quite well I haven't really got anything coming up I've got I've been today I was working on maybe some merchandise stuff with my friend trying to get that going so watch this space for that you can find me on Instagram it's at Danny Hart one the same on Twitter try and do a little bit more with YouTube obviously Madison Saracen on Instagram as well follow us on there we're doing a lot of stuff with the team we had a podcast come out um, last week, which is on my channel and also on, on Madison Saracen's YouTube channel if you want to go there. And there's a fun little quiz competition running on there at the end of the, of the podcast. So go there, answer the questions, try and win some cool prizes from the team. But I think that's about it from us. And thank you for watching if you like it like it comment and share it and subscribe to my channel and hopefully we'll be able to do some more of these in the future with some different people let me know in the comments who you would who you would enjoy another interview with thanks everybody we'll catch you soon yes everybody see ya <laughs>